was uh, I'll let you introduce yourself, Rocco, and uh, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Don. So, hey everyone. Um, I'll be very quick with the introduction uh, because uh, we uh, kind of I already presented it in the past, but just a quick um, introduction about what we're going to talk today. Um, the topic is about purse trading, and as I was talking to Don in preparation for this meeting, um, we thought that it might be good to also provide some kind of a background information as to what are the tools that are kind of underlying the, the concept of pair trading. So I'll be going through some basic information about correlation, linear regression, distributions. So I apologize if maybe some of these things may be a little bit too easy or for, for some of you, or maybe you already, you already know them, but um, we thought that it may be good to kind of set the foundations for everyone uh, before we get into the kind of a more complicated aspect of it. And uh, some of the parts towards the end of the slide of the presentation are going to be a little bit more math heavy, uh, but um, I'll try to kind of focus on the concept more than than the actual the actual math. So you can kind of ignore the math, but uh, as long as you kind of get the concept, then uh, everything should be fine. Um, so about myself, uh, just, uh, just to say that uh, I work uh, um, in a software company called SaaS, and we do software for enterprise risk management solutions for banks and insurance companies. And um, today I'm presenting as uh, Option Traders, which is a, a research institution that, uh, that we, we also offer uh, training courses. We operate in Italy. And, um, and so because of that, uh, I need to also make sure that we cover about the, um, the disclaimer. So um, I, I'm not a um, financial advisor, so please take everything that I said as my own personal opinion, but uh, trade at your own risk as always. So just making sure that um, we cover this aspect before we can move on with the, with the next step. All right, so um, what is a pair trading? It, at the kind of a, the basic idea is that we're trying to find, um, it's kind of a, a, a simultaneous trading of a pair of two or more assets altogether, right? And so these assets could be equities, indexes, um, um, ETFs, or, or, or any else, you know, like uh, commodities or whatever. Um, and the, the basic idea behind this is to uh, find a, a pair that uh, kind of tends to move together. Now, we'll define a little bit more what it means to move together. Um, but if we find this pair, then we can leverage the relationship between these two assets. And uh, we can create a position that basically uh, works in a way where if one trade goes against me, uh, I mean, one asset goes against me, the other asset will work uh, kind of as a, as a hedge, right? So it kind of protects me. So they kind of move together. So if everything goes well, you 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 win. If you if you lose on one side, the other one might help you protect you and kind of uh, offset the losses and vice versa. And and so instead of actually trading individual edges, in, sorry, individual uh, assets, essentially we're creating a trade which works as a whole. So we're focusing on on the entire pair trade as a whole, rather than the individual underlines. Um, and, uh, but there's another aspect that we need to focus on, which is uh, once we create a, a, a trading based on, on a pair, uh, if this is done the right way, um, it should behave as a mean reverting process. And so, and this is very important. Otherwise the whole concept of pair trading basically um, becomes useless. So what do I mean by this is that um, it, we are, expecting to find a mech, uh, uh, the, if, you, if you look at the, at the pair trade as a whole, um, it moves like a, something that kind of oscillates up and down around a certain value, which would be the, the, the mean. And this mean could be zero or could be some, some fixed value. But the point is that you should see some kind of oscillations up and down. And what we want to do is, is obviously trade on these oscillations because we expect this process to be mean reverting, meaning that if it goes above the average, above the mean, uh, eventually will come back so we can trade this information. If it goes below the average, same story, we can trade betting on the fact that it will, it will have a tendency to revert to the mean. But obviously we need to find a, a pair that has this, that has this property um, and that we can to a certain extent rely on, 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 on this aspect. Otherwise the whole concept doesn't work. So essentially, uh, because we're using statistics for all of these, uh, this is a, uh, essentially, pair trading is a, is a type of arbitrage. It's, it's called statistical ar arbitrage. And uh, this is different from price arbitrage where you're trying to, um, to kind of uh, make a profit 
based on, on price differences, which is extremely diff difficult in today's market because unless you are an, a high frequency trader, um, it's basically impossible to, to find inefficiencies in price. Um, but statistical arbitrage actually um, works because it, it's, it's based on statistics and it's based on kind of probabilities to actually find profitable trades. So obviously it doesn't work all the time, but it, has a, it gives you an edge in terms of uh, uh, higher probability. And so what do I mean when I was talking about uh, moving together is that um, for a pair to kind of move together, it basically means that uh, there has to be some kind of statistical relationship uh, between the two uh, underlying, the two assets that we're trying to, um, to trade. And, um, and what we want to do is to kind of leverage uh, this concept of probability and statistics to construct a trade that has a higher probability of profit, right? So that's the kind of the, the overall the overall idea. And um, the objective for today is not to focus on, on formulas and equations, but it's mostly to understand the concept. And uh, and I, as we go through it, I'll show you that you can actually calculate pretty much everything you need using a simple Excel spreadsheet or, or, or Google sheet um, with, with few exceptions. Um, so what it really matters is basically understanding the concept. And once you know that, the rest is fairly uh, fairly simple. So um, unfortunately, because we had to talk about statistics, we had to cover the basics. So I'll, uh, I'll start by talking about correlation, um, which is kind of the, the foundation aspect by which we that we use to identify um, uh, assets that, that we could consider for, for a pair trade. And so, first of all, what's a correlation? Uh, essentially, it's a measure of, of the degree by which two assets move together, move in coordination with each other. And so, um, kind of broadly speaking, if they are moving in the same direction, uh, we say that these assets have a positive correlation. Uh, if they move kind of in an opposite direction, so when one goes up, the other one goes down, uh, that would be negative correlation. And um, if they are kind of moving independently from each other, so there's really uh, no kind of no relationship between the two, then we talk about uh, no correlation. So obviously this is a qualitative uh, definition. Uh, there's a more formal one, but um, which comes in a second, but forget about a formula on the top, on the top left, um, essentially, there is this value that can be calculated, and using Google Sheet um, or, or even Excel, there's this formula called uh, Corel uh, that you can use to calculate the correlation coefficient. And this will be a number between minus one and plus one. And so, uh, how does this work? Uh, just kind of graphically speaking, uh, let's say that we have uh, two time series, uh, so X and Y and uh, over uh, five time periods from T0 to T4. And so what we do is like we, we graph them on a, on a chart. So for example, we take the, the first point which will be X equal two and Y equal 2.5. And we draw it on this, on this, uh, on this, on this plane. And uh, we do the same for all of the other uh, points that there are on, on, our, on our table. And um, essentially, if you can, if you look at these points there, when we look at, when you, we draw them on a plane, uh, there is a bit of a pattern in this, right? We, we can see that when the 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 first variable x is is growing, then so does the the variable y. So there is a certain level of relationship. Now, obviously, we're talking about five points, so five points is not statistically significant, but kind of a, a, as a general idea, if when one variable increases, so does the second variable, then in this case we will be talking about positive correlation, and. Um, the correlation coefficient is just basically a measure, a number of how much these variables are correlated. And so in this particular example, the correlation will be 0 0.91, which means that it's pretty high correlation. So because one is the maximum. Um, so when the coefficient, which is also called uh, rho using the Greek letter, uh, when this value is equal to one, uh, we have basically a perfect positive correlation. When the value is negative one, we have a, po a perfect negative correlation. Um, and uh, when this value is basically kind of zero or, or close to zero, it means that there is no correlation between these two, uh, these two variables. So to give you some more examples, here's kind of a, some possible scenarios. So on the left, we have, for example, a perfect correlation. So you can see that all of these dots basically are on a line. So that means that we have a perfect knowledge of if we know what the value of one variable, the other one will move in the other, we will know, move, we'll move exactly uh, according to certain relationship, because there, all these points are on a line. Um, if we move on this chart here on the middle top, 
uh, we can see that the, the relationship is still there, but the, the, these various points are kind of uh, uh, moving away from this kind of from this line, right? So uh, there is a relationship, there is a pattern where when one grows, the other one grows as well. Um, but the, you know, it's not an exact an exact um, line or an exact formula. And, um, uh, and on the top right, you have another example of this, and we talk about weak correlation because again, these points are following a pattern, but uh, less and less. There's more kind of a variation uh, from from kind of the, from, from the line that you, that you see there. And on the bottom, it's kind of the same, but just uh, in terms of negative correlation because it means that when one variable grows, the other one uh, decreases. And so, same concept of perfect or strong uh, correlation or, or or weak correlation. And again, if you cannot see any particular pattern, basically means that all of these dots will be kind of random on this on this chart. Then we are talking about um, uh, zero correlation. So um, here is an example of two assets. Um, and just by looking at the assets, you cannot really say whether they are correlated or not. I mean, it's very hard to 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 do it with a with a naked eye. So that's why we have to kind of uh, use these um, these uh, calculations. And um, uh, what we do is we never really do the correlation of the price itself. What we do is we calculate the returns, typically daily returns, log returns, whatever. And we calculate what is the correlation of the returns of these two assets. And um, here's an example where, as you can see, these two assets have a, a perfect correlation of, of equal one. <clears throat> and uh, here on the bottom left, you see there's a, uh, Basically, all of these dots follow exactly on a on a line. Now, uh, you will not find this type of correlation in real life. Um, these two uh, time series were generated using uh, a software that generates random time series, and it generated them using making sure that they have an exact correlation of one. So, um, but if you were just to look at the at the chart, you would never know that these have uh, such a high correlation. Um, so. Uh, but I want to kind of show you another aspect of this because um, if you look at, at this other example, you will see basically th this is a distribution of the, of the various dots. Uh, so we have one, two assets again, uh, asset one and asset two. And uh, these dots are basically how they, 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 they look within each other. So uh, there is a, obviously a strong pattern. There is a strong um, relationship between these two, so one might might expect that the correlation would be uh, pretty high. However, if we go and calculate uh, the correlation coefficient, we find that this value is basically cl close to zero, um, which would tell us that there is zero correlation. And so um, this is basically essentially kind of a warning for for everyone that the correlation coefficient. This is called the Pearson correlation. Is the, the Pearson is the person that came up with this formula. Um, so this co this correlation coefficient can only measure uh, correlation if it is linear, if there's a linear relationship. In this case, as you can see, there is a quadratic relationship between the two. So basically one is the square of the other. And so um, this type of correlation will not be able to pick up this type of relationship. So uh, long story short is even when you see that there is zero correlation, it doesn't mean that the two variables are not related. It just means that there is no uh, statistical significance to say that, the, that these two are related in a linear way. A um, few more warnings about the use of correlation. Uh, the first one, very important, is that uh, people tend to uh, confuse the concept of correlation with the concept of causation. So correlation means that two variables are uh, tend to move in the same way, uh, but it doesn't tell, tell us anything about the, the cause and effect. So it doesn't mean that one, just because there's a correlation between two variables, it doesn't mean that um, one variable causes uh, the second variable, right? So like uh, the, when one increases, it, it forces or it causes an increase in the other variable or, 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 or vice versa. And so uh, causation is a completely different thing uh, between the cor between correlation. And so when you find correlation between two variables, sometimes this can also be a spurious correlation, it means that it just happens by uh, by chance. And so you have to be careful uh, about this. So just to give you an example, um, you might find a very high correlation between um, the consumption of coffee. And uh, as an Italian, I drink a lot of coffee. And so that's why this thing is very dear to my heart. And uh, the the um, incidence of, of uh, uh, lung cancer, and so why might one might 
think that, okay, well, then coffee is causing cancer. The reality is that um, if you're a smoker, uh, most of the time you end up smoking right after you get a coffee. And so that is really the hidden relationship that, is, that exists between these two things. So just because it's a correlation between drinking coffee and then getting cancer, uh, it doesn't mean that one causes the other. So just be careful of, the, of this aspect. Um, another, another important aspect is um, the fact that correlation is not uh, transitive in general. Uh, and what do I mean by this is that if we find uh, two pairs, let's say A and B, and then B and C. And so if we find that A and B are, are correlated and, and also B is correlated to C, this does not mean that A is, co is going to be correlated to C. So just because the two pairs have one pair in com one asset in common, it does, not, it does not mean that the correlation simply translates from one pair to the other. Um, and so we, you have to be very careful uh, because correlation across transitivity uh, goes with the square of, of uh, I mean, I'm not going to get to the math, to the math but basically, um, trust me that uh, it, it's not a transitive property. And essentially, it, this is kind of true only if the two pairs are very highly correlated to begin with. So if both A and B have a very high correlation, let's say 0.9 or 0.95, and so is the second pair, 0.9 or 0.95, then yes, A and C might still be quite correlated uh, it may not it may not be as high as the first two but um but again if the two are highly correlated yes the, this transitivity works a little bit otherwise it doesn't um and a third uh, a final aspect is that um correlation is not static meaning that it changes with time it's very sensitive to how many data points you are you are working with um so obviously you have to kind of look for um uh, how these properties change over time to, to make sure that it, it's still a valid correlation. You're still looking at a pair that is still tradable in, in, in our case. Um, and uh, another aspect is how does correlation plays in the context of diversification? Um, if you're looking at diversification, basically you're trying to, the, the objective is basically to reduce the, the PNL volatility. And a way to do this is typically by, if you create a portfolio, um, you would go and, uh, buy or well, basically trade uh, different instruments that are that have low correlation because what you're trying to do here is uh, uh, remove the fact that when uh, one goes up, the other one goes up, and yes, okay, you make money, but if when they both go down together, you lose money together, right? So you want to have some kind of a, a condition where uh, if one goes up, the other one goes down, uh, they kind of uh, offset each other a little bit, and so by diversifying across multiple asset classes, uh, essentially you reduce what is called the idiosyncratic risk. And uh, you're, you're still exposed to the market risk because usually when the market goes down, like there's a big shock, then everything goes down and there's nothing you can do about it. But in general, by doing a lot of diversification across multiple asset classes, you tend to reduce the volatility of your portfolio. And so for this, you're usually looking at assets that have very low correlation between each other. And an example of this could be maybe trading uh, uh, food companies versus technology companies because they tend to have kind of a, you know, to be less uh, correlated with each other. Um, another another way would be, for example, to trade multiple strategies. Um, for example, especially if you're doing option, obviously it would be maybe um, uh, strangles versus butterflies versus spread or or whatever else. So having multiple strategies basically means you you have a, when one wins, the other one may lose, and vice versa. But um, you are kind of trying to. Uh, diversify your entire portfolio of strategies. And the first one, the third one is also using different expirations uh, because uh, it can help you basically diversify your gamma exposure, uh, especially if you're, if you're trading, for example, short-term um, short options. Um, so, okay, great. But how is this, how, how does anything of these have any, I mean, how does this stuff has anything to do with, with purse trading? Well, the point is, if we find the correlation between two assets, which is very high, that is a starting point basically to do purse trading, right? So while when we do the diversification, we want to have zero, as close to zero as possible to correlation. When we're looking for purse trading, we want the opposite. So these are the kind of the two coins of the, of the, of the same aspect. So um, one last, I mean, another kind of a aspect we have to cover is the concept of uh, linear regression. And um, uh, essentially a regression is, nothing else that, than a model that describes the relationship between two or more variables. And um, 
uh, we usually we, we call the dependent variable, which is the, the variable that we're trying to model. It's called the dependent variable, or it's also called the target or the response variable. And then the other variable, the one that, that describes or, or that explains the relationship, it's called the independent variable or the regressor. And um, so what are the kind of practical uses, use cases of this thing? Um, essentially, we can use it to uh, help us explain the variation of the response variable with respect to the to the to the dependent independent variable, so it can help us understand what is the cause and effect relationship between these variables. And uh, another use case is that obviously we can make predictions because if we are building a model, then we can use this model to 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 make a forecast, to make a prediction about what might happen when there's a change in the dependent variable. Um, and the reason why I put these uh, the pictures on the top right of uh, Gauss and Legend is because these are the two that basically formalize this concept of linear regression. And I uh, I think uh, I mean Gauss is kind of one of the geniuses of math and worked in so many so many fields. But just to give you an idea, linear regression was invented to try to explain the movement of the planets and try to forecast where the planets would be. Um, and uh, obviously, it's used in pretty much anywhere in in real life these these days. Um, so and I'll give you another example in, in a second, but um, I just thought to pay homage to uh, to these two uh, giants of, of math. And uh, we talk about linear regression because it's a special case of a regression where the relationship they were trying to model is, is basically made through linear equations. Um, so what does it mean linear regression? So again, let's, let's say for example that um, we are trying, we have uh, two variables. One is the, uh, the number of ice cream sold um, and uh, our X variable will be the, the temperature. And we're trying to see if there is a relationship between how many ice creams have been sold based on the temperature. And you would expect, I mean, if you look at this chart, is that when the temperature raise, rises, then so does the number of ice creams sold. As you can imagine, during summer, everything uh, temperature is hot, so everyone wants to have an ice cream. And so you can see this kind of relationship, right, between, the, between these two variables. And uh, essentially, you're trying to model this through through a, a line. That's why it's called linear regression. And uh, a typical format of this line is is the one you see on the top, where basically um, you have um, alpha, which is called the uh, it's called the intercept, and basically represents what is the value of my um, of my dependent variable when the independent variable is zero. Uh, it's basically the, the this offset. And then uh, we have a beta, which is the parameter that we're, uh, another parameter that we want to estimate, um, which basically represents the um, the degree, the angle uh, of their of this line. Basically, uh, the higher the beta, the more this line uh, kind of tends to be uh, going kind of uh, going up. If beta is negative, the line will kind of go, go down, and if, if beta is zero, you will get basically a parallel line like the parallel to the to the uh, x axis. And then finally, there's an error term that basically describes, well, okay, I have a model, but my model is never perfect. There's always going to be some, some kind of an error, right? And so um, essentially, how do we ex estimate alpha and beta? Um, a, a typical method is called the, the least squares. There's many others, but the least square is the one that has um, some of the best properties when it comes to efficient estimation of, of, of the values. Um, and uh, essentially tries to minimize, it finds the, the line, that minimizes the distance between each of these points to uh, the, to the to the actual uh, line. It actually minimizes the square of, of the distance. That's why it's called the least squares. And um, essentially, the error term is nothing as the distance, right? The error between the actual value and the value that would be predicted by my model. And in this case, my model is basically the this uh, this line. So if you're using uh, Google Sheet or if you're using uh, Excel. Um, you can use the function called uh, uh, linest for estimating a linear regression. And it will give you back basically the values for uh, alpha and, uh, and, and beta. All right, so how do we do this? Usually once we do uh, a, a, a linear regression, we, we take a look at the error term, right? The, the distance between basically the real value and the value that we're predicting. And that distance, that error term, um, ideally would be uh, distributed according to the normal distribution. So. Uh, don't pay too much attention about the the the, the formulas here, but what matters here is that is this this bell shaped curve, right? And uh, why is this important? Is because as you will see in a moment, when we are dealing with pair trade, 
what we're doing is we're looking at a spread between two, uh, between a pair of, of assets. And that spread essentially behaves like this error term. And so ideally, if this error term is like a, a, a normal distribution, it means that we would expect the error, which means the spread, to be essentially around the, the zero or around the average 68% um, of the time, or at least within one standard deviation, uh, about 68% uh, of the time. And if it turns out that we find that the spread is above one standard deviation or below one standard deviation, or even better, above two or two standard deviations either on either side, this will be a very uh, unlikely event, which means that there's a high chance that the spread will go back to the average, right, to, to the mean. So we'll, we'll revert back to zero. So that's the kind of concept be, be, between the, the, the pair threading. We're trying to find the edges and see whenever the spread moves around the, each side on, 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 the, on the extremes, then we, we, we hope and we expect, obviously in statistical terms, that this edge, uh, this, um, this spread goes back to, to, to the average. And we'll see this a little uh, better in, in, in a few slides as, as we get there. Um, but just to give you a, kind of a, a, a real life example of where do we see standard normal distribution? I mean, where, we do, where, do, we, where do we see normal distributions in, in, in everyday life? Uh, it actually happens pretty much everywhere. But next time you go to the gym, uh, maybe take a look at the at the weights uh, on on the weight lift, um, and you will see how the normal distribution is there. Basically, you, as you can see, that the most used weight is currently in the middle, and obviously higher weight are less likely to be there, to be used, as well as a uh, uh, small weights uh, actually well, uh, the opposite in, in this case. But essentially, as you can see, this. Uh, the usage of the pay of the scale is pretty much the same as uh, follows kind of a, almost like a normal distribution. All right, so uh, we're almost there. Um, what do we need? Uh, the final ingredient for our, for our pair trading is the concept of z-score. And so the, the z-score is, you can kind of ignore the formulas here, but essentially is a way to compare uh, two different uh, variables. So if we, if we have one spread and we have a second spread, uh, obviously, each one will, will maybe, if you're lucky, it, there will be normal distributions, but they may have different uh, volatility. And so um, turning these variables using these scores, it's a just simple transformation that um, it turns an, a, a variable into a normal distribution. So that essentially, we, we standardize both variables and we can compare them so that they're all um, relative to their standard deviation. So basically, we can say, uh, if a variable is above one standard deviation, essentially means that the z-score of that variable is above one. If, the, if that variable is, a, is a above two standard deviations, the z-score of that variable will be greater than two. So it's just a simple way to standardize numbers so that we can compare multiple variables in the same way. Uh, just one last thing to remember is that you can only calculate this, well, you can calculate this score on any data, but it only makes sense if you are dealing with Gaussian distributions. Uh, if your data is not distributed with a normal distribution, with a Gaussian distribution, then uh, the z-score kind of loses uh, a lot of its power. So it, it may not be very, uh, very significant. Um, all right, so we're finally in, in can, we can talk about per, per threading now that we have all, all of these kind of baseline concepts. And so, how do we identify a pair, right? We talked about before that pair trading is all about finding pairs of assets that move together. Well, there's um, there's many methods that can be used. Um, some are qualitative in nature, some are more quantitative. Uh, on the qualitative side, um, a way would be, for example, to um, choose assets that are uh, typically work in the same industry. For example, Pepsi and Coca-Cola, they are both producers of... of of, of, uh, of drinks and um, chances are that, you know, they're very highly correlated because they operate in the same market. Um, or another way could be, for example, to uh, look at, looking at an index and the symbols that are underlying that index. For example, Tesla and S&P 500. Uh, why would we do that? Because by definition, if an asset, if a symbol is, is part of an index, then it means that, that index was constructed using a, an equation, using a formula that uh, is, is basically weighted on uh, based on the values of, of that underlying, right? And so that relationship is already there. So we can we can um, we can use that that relationship and, and exploit it whenever possible. Um, 
now again, these are quantitative methods, but on the quantitative side, there's a, a variety of different methods. So what I'll describe today is kind of one of the most uh, common, but there's uh, there's others, and there's some um, some are better, some are some are worse, some are more complicated. This one I feel is uh, somewhere in between being uh, pretty good in terms of results, uh, but at the same time is fairly simple compared to other methods that are um, more complicated. And I'll, I'll mention some of them uh, maybe later. Um, so a, a way to kind of a, do a first screening of which are the the uh, assets that we could potentially consider for for um, our pairs um, would be to basically run a correlation across each pair of assets and find which ones of those pairs have a high correlation coefficient. And by high, I put a value of, for example, of 0 0.7. Uh, in, in 0 0.7 is an absolute value, meaning that it could be greater than 0 0.7 or or less than negative 0 0.7. So either direction, basically either highly correlated on the positive side or highly correlated on the negative side. Um, again, this value is kind of a threshold, but uh, I guess it's up to anyone to, to choose whatever value you want, but this would be kind of a good starting point. Um, now, great. So, so let's see an example here, for example, of a couple of assets where we have um, um, S, uh, SPX, the, the Qs and the Russell. So what I did in this chart is basically on the right, on the right triangles here on the top, you see the correlation coefficients. And as you can see, they're uh, fairly high. So there's obviously there's a, this number 0 0.87 is the correlation coefficient between the Qs and the SPX. And uh, this value here of 0 0.75 is the correlation coefficient computed between the Russell and the, and the SPX. So again, this data was based on, um, on historical data for return or historical daily returns from uh, uh, 2021. Uh, on the on the middle uh, diagonal, you'll see the distribution of the returns, and uh, as you can see, they're not uh, exactly uh, distributed according to the normal distribution. So um, just obviously keep in mind of this. And on the bottom side, you see the the kind of correlation chart, where you see all these dots, and uh, but you can see that it's there's pretty pretty much clear uh, relationship, especially for example between the SPX and the Q. Um, essentially, I mean, the, the points are pretty much on, on, on a line, right? So that's a pretty strong signal that uh, there's a good relationship between these two, these two, um, uh, these two assets. So um, we'll get to a, a practical example uh, a little bit later, but I wanted to explain a little bit more now, okay, how does it really work? And so let's assume that we have um, two assets like this, uh, X1 and X2. And um, if you look at these two, um, you might, not know again, but just by visual inspection, you might not know whether um, these are correlated or, or or not, and whether they are they are a pair. Uh, in, in reality, this is an exact is a perfect pair. It couldn't get better than this. Um, but the, again, you wouldn't know if you just look at the numbers. And so, what we would do in this particular example is to essentially calculate the spread, which is basically saying uh, I would for every um, share of asset one of the X1, I would go that I buy, I would go and sell three and a half shares of, of the asset X2. And then if I do this, the spread, if I calculate the spread between these two using this, uh, this ratio of uh, one to three and a half, and we, we, we kind of uh, show a chart of this, of the difference between these two of the spread, essentially what, trading a pair means trading this spread. We don't care the what the movements of the individual assets is. We're just looking at the, the movement of the spread of these two uh, using uh, what we call a pair ratio, which is this value in this case of uh, 3.5. So how do we use this information? Well, first of all, if you look at this chart, you will see that it kind of oscillates up and down uh, along a, a certain average value, which in this case is kind of this uh, uh, dotted green line. And so ideally, um, when we are reaching the top on the on the high side. Um, it's 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 a good time to basically short um, X1 and go long on X2 because it means that basically if the spread is too high, it means that the two assets are diverging too much, which means that X1 is getting too big, going because it's it's raising much faster than the rate at which X2 is raising, and so this is creating a difference in the spread between the two. Um, and so by shorting one and, and, and going long on the other, we're betting that this spread is going to reduce. Um, and on the on the opposite side, when when the spread goes too, too small or goes negative, 
who are doing the opposite. We are, we are buying the first and shorting the second. Um, and so uh, now the question is like, okay, great, but how do I calculate this this value? What is this three point five? Why why did we why did we use this value? Um, so uh, first of all, let me show you the the correlation. Right, the first thing we do is we calculate the correlation, and we find out that um, the correlation coefficient is zero point ninety four, which means that these two pair of assets are pretty highly correlated. And uh, also, if you look at the relationship uh, diagram here on the bottom, we can see that basically they're kind of on a on a on a on a straight line. Um, Next step is uh, we are basically uh, trying to fit, we are doing a, a linear regression and we're trying to find out what is the relationship, what is the ratio between the two, right? This is what we call the pair ratio. And so um, we have the data of the returns for the, or, or actually we have the data for the first asset with the price of the second asset. And we're trying to find out what is the value of beta and the alpha. These are the, uh, the beta is the pair ratio the alpha would be the intercept. The intercept essentially is uh, uh, the average here. This this value here, the the the, the, dotal, the dotted green line, and um, and the, the the last piece is the the residual, which is basically the error term. Whatever is left is is an error, right? Because we, we will never be able to find a perfect model. And so uh, to estimate alpha and beta, we use a linear regression. Uh, so again, you can use Google Sheet. Or, or Excel using the Linus function, or um, in this case, I, I use a software called uh, R, and um, and this is a typical output that you would see if you use R to, to estimate a linear regression. Um, don't, I know that it looks kind of scary, but we'll get to kind of the, the, the various pieces that are most important. So first of all, if you look here at the coefficient section, it tells me that um, the beta is basically this value here, 3.50466, right? So this is the, the value of beta. And um, what it says here, intercept, this is the value of alpha. So in this case, is minus 180. Then uh, the next step we want to look at is uh, these values here on, on the right side. Um, essentially, is every, just because you do a linear regression, it doesn't mean that the value that you estimated are good values. We always have to question, are these numbers, are these values of alpha and beta that we just estimated? Are they uh, statistically significant? Or did we just find these numbers by pure luck, right? So, because it could also be possible that sometimes, um, you know, you have a bunch of data, you have an analysis. If you look hard enough, you will always find some kind of a relationship between the data, but is that relationship real or is it just happening by chance? And so the p-value, it's basically trying to find out what is, the, what is the likelihood that we have found these numbers by pure luck? Right, and if that if the likelihood is zero, we're basically saying, well, it, it didn't happen by luck. It, there, there must be a good relationship, and that's why we found these numbers. So ideally, we want these numbers to be basically closest to zero. And in this case, it's basically saying it's less than uh, one to the minus sixteen. Uh, so basically, it's, it's basically zero, right? And that's why you see here three stars. And um, depending on the value that you see on these values on these uh, on these probabilities. Um, uh, it means that you have a certain level of confidence in your estimation. So if the p-value is zero, it means you are a very good estimate. Um, if it's uh, you know less than 0 0.001, it means you have 99.9% .9 confidence that this is a good uh, estimation. Um, if the p-value basically uh, gets bigger than 0 0.05, um, it means that, well, the parameters may be unreliable, so there, you might as well have found these numbers by, by pure luck. So we don't know for sure. And that's why we have to always take a look at these numbers and see, are these statistically significant or not? And so how are these values calculated? Essentially, um, that's where you see this uh, T value. This is, is, is looking at a, 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 a T student distribution and looking at what is the probability of finding that number by pure luck. And this is what it looks like. You don't have really to, to, to kind of pay too much attention to this, but this is automatically calculated by, by many statistical softwares. Uh, unfortunately, if you're using Excel or, or, or Google, uh, you will not get this, uh, these values that, that I'm showing you here. You can calculate them in Excel. You have to do a bit of a, a matrix multiplication. So it, it, it's not for the faint of art, but it, it, it can be done uh, in Excel as well. Um, all right, so now, Fine, we, we find the value of beta, right? And okay, we know that there's a certain ratio between these two. 
And now we're going to look at what is the spread. And the spread is basically the first asset minus uh, beta times the, the, the second asset. And the leftover is going to be our intercept, so our uh, mean value, plus a certain error that we call uh, epsilon. And so ideally, we want to check that this uh, piece right here moves like, a, like um, basically it, it oscillates up and down uh, around a certain average, and the average would be this, uh, this alpha value. And so if, but we have to prove that this is the case, that we just found a, a, a relationship between these two variables such that the, the spread essentially is moving around around this uh, around this uh, this, uh, this average so these are the two conditions so uh, you need to have something which is kind of stable around a certain value the average and this is what we call the edge condition and it needs to be kind of fluctuate up and down and have a, have a property that kind of a, tends to mean revert towards that value and and if you have these two conditions um essentially in in, in statistical terms uh it means we need to check for stationarity stationarity is a um it, it requires certain um degree of of, uh, of calculations but I mean purely from uh, in intuitive term again we want, we want to make sure that whatever we found is a relationship that basically over time oscillates up and down around a certain value because if we find those those oscillations we know that when it goes up we're gonna sh uh, short the first and buy the second when it goes down we do the opposite so we uh, we buy the first uh, sorry we short the first and we buy the second so by the first and short second. All right, so how do we check for a stationarity? Uh, I'm gonna go very quick on this slide because it's kind of math heavy. I just wanna give a, give you a feel, but the idea is, okay, we found a spread, but can we predict what the what the spread would be at, at time plus, t plus one if we know what the value is of the spread at uh, time t? So that's basically a simple equation where we say, well, we want to uh, predict the value of the spread at the next time period. So let's say next day, given that we know what is the value of the spread at time t, which is time time today. And we want to find the value of this kind of values of phi, a and v. These are all um, some, some constant, a constant term and then uh, some prediction factor. Apologies for the Italian here, I forgot. And uh, long story short is um, if it turns out that this value phi is bigger than one in module in, 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 in absolute term, this entire process explodes, which means that we have found a pair that it's not really good because it's this is not going to oscillate up and down on an average. These are this oscillation will go bigger and bigger and the whole thing basically will fall apart. So this is not a good uh, uh, pair that we want to trade. We want to stay away from it. That's why we need to check for stationarity. Um, if the value of, of this uh, fee value uh, in, in absolute term is less than one, then the process is uh, stationary. And um, to check for this thing, we have to do some, some kind of a math manipulations, run another linear regression, and eventually find what is the probability that, that again, that this thing is stationary or not. To calculate this, it's, it gets um, quite complicated, so I'm going to kind of skip the details. Uh, but just uh, there is a lot of software that can do this. Uh, if you use Python, there's um, this test is called the augmented Dickey filler test. Uh, you can find it in Python. You can find it in R um, um, or in Java. I mean, it's available in many languages. Unfortunately, it's not available in Excel. So again, to do it in Excel, you have to put some some elbow grease. But it, it can be done as well. But the long story short is forget about the formulas. If you look at this chart on the right side. Uh, essentially the blue line is the, the spread and the red line that is, as you can see, is basically overlapping on it, is a model which tests for, for stationarity. And the model, is, as you can see, is predicting very well. It means that, that this data that we have follow this pattern of oscillating up or down. It doesn't explode. It doesn't go anywhere. It stays within that, that kind of range. And that is a good condition because it means that we can actually use this information to trade our, our, um, our pair. So how do we do this in practice? So now we have a lot of information. We know what is the correlation. We know what is the linear regression. Great, but how do I actually put this into practice and especially using options? Um, so the first thing is we would have to, again, uh, kind of uh, uh, explore the universe of assets and see which one are the good ones that we could potentially consider for pair trend. And so the first step is basically to run 
correlations and find the ones that have a high correlation. Step number two is we, we do a linear regression to find out what is the pair ratio? What is the ratio of in that, in that example that I gave you was a 3.5. What is the beta value, right? Between the two. It tells me how many shares of one do I have to buy in relationship to the shares of the other? So if you have a beta of three, it means that for every one share of the first asset, you are buying or selling three shares of, of the other. So that's, um, that's what the concept of the beta is. Um, once we find the beta, uh, we need to compute the spread and we have to check for that this spread is stationary, right? You wanna make sure that it kind of oscillates up and down. And so there's two, two ways to do this. Well, at, at first, at least we would look at it and do a visual inspection and see, does this spread sh give a, kind of a shows a, a mean revert reverting pattern? Is it oscillating up and down or is it something that goes completely random? And uh, to be a little more uh, formal, we would also do at least a test, a statistical check, which is called, again, this uh, augmented Dick Fuller. Uh, there's other tests. Um, now, a word of caution that, unfortunately, it's very hard to, um, to estimate uh, this stationarity when you're dealing with financial series data, because if you are, if you're using a lot of data, it means if you're using two years of data or three years worth of data, you will get these numbers. You will get a very good stationarity. The problem is that time series, financial time series, don't stay the same over a long period of time. So usually they are, they, you, you may find a pair that move together for a month or two or three, but then eventually they, they break out and they, they do something else. So stationarity is very hard to find when you have, uh, because it, it happens in, in shorter period of times. And so uh, to, 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 to uh, find these values statistically, uh, unfortunately, if you're looking at short time period, it means you have uh, a, a small number of observations. So sometimes it's hard to actually prove it mathematically or statistically that, that, there, is, uh, that there is stationarity. Now, the fact that you cannot prove it statistically, it doesn't mean that it's not there. It just means that, well, it's a bit harder. So you have to kind of uh, do some more, more checks before you, you decide to make a trade. Um, now, let's say that we have found that it's, that it's stationary. How do we actually go about uh, trading the pair? Well, first thing is we want to, uh, to have a reference. Like, as I said before, when the spread is too high, we want to we wanna short the spread. When the spread is too low, we want to uh, go, go long the spread. Okay, but what does it mean too high or too low? Essentially, we, want, we need to have a, some kind of a standardized way of doing this. And so what we do is um, we are calculating a z-score, and the z-score would be a standardized normal variable. So essentially, if the z-score is greater than one, or 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 or, or um, it basically means that we are 1.5 standard deviation. Sorry, in this case 1.5. It means that we are 1.5 standard deviation above the average, right? So which means that the, there's a quite good chance that it's going to come back because it's already 1.5 standard deviation away. And same story if the spread is below the mean by is is less than apology. This should be le less than negative 1.5. There's a there's a typo in here. I'll, I'll fix it later. Then it means that we're below and we should basically go along the spread, which means buying the first and shorting the second. Um, so, okay, but we can do this with, with either assets directly by buying and selling shares, or we can do it with options. So if you wanna do it with, with stocks or, or, the, or, or the actual asset itself, what we do essentially, we buy or sell the pair um, in the ratio of one to beta, meaning that we, we buy or sell uh, beta shares of, X2 for each share of X1. Um, another way of doing this is by using options. And so, again, we would, we would choose long or short strategies, and, and this can be spread, it can be whatever you like, but essentially, instead of using the actual shares, we use a proxy for the shares, and we know that the delta of an option is a proxy for the number of shares of that option. And so, what we would do is we use the ratio of delta between a position that we put on one asset and let's say we, we buy a spread on one on, and we sell a spread on, on the other. And by doing this, we, do, we obviously we need to check what is the delta of one position against the delta of the other position. And we need to see that these are in the, in the ratio of one to beta, essentially. And uh, you could do with 
balance contracts, for example, one, one spread versus one thread, one spread, or you could do it with a unbalanced contract. For example, you could uh, have three, uh, three spread of one uh, against one spread of the other, right? So you can kind of adjust the number of contract, you can adjust the, the, the distance of the spread or the, the, the width of the spread. I mean, again, this is an example with spreads, but you can use whatever strategies you like. The point is that while with, with, with the stock, the only thing you can do is buy one and, and sell the other. With options, you have so many more um, possibilities uh, to, to, to trade. So you can adjust in so many different ways. So you have much more flexibility. You can also have much more room in case of, in case of, uh, of error, in case your, your, your spread doesn't go the way you would expect. Essentially, the whole idea behind this is that, uh, and let me just go quickly back on, on this chart, is if we are right, if we are above right at this point, right on the top, we would hope there's a certain high probability that this spread is gonna uh, come back down. But what if it doesn't, right? So if you are if you are buying um, and and selling the, the underlying directly, um, well, this can quickly go against you and you're gonna lose money right away. But if you're using options, you can actually position your spreads. Kind of a little bit far away, you can give yourself a little bit more room so that even if it doesn't go straight right away in the direction that you want, you can still make money. And I'll give an example with some potential trade ideas, for example, for next week or something. Right? So just, just to prove the point on, on how you can use options. Um, so getting back to last point is okay, well, also if you use options, it's not just about the strategy and the spread and the delta, but also about the expiration, right? So what what's the expiration that you could use? Um, like how far in time should it be a week away, should it be 10 days away, a month away, and so on. And um, essentially, you can look at the, the spread chart and, and look at like how fast does it take to come back to the mean when uh, when it's when it's away. I mean, this is obviously a very qualitative way of doing this. Uh, there is a more formal way to calculate what is the mean reversion speed, but we won't get into that. But I mean, a quick way to do this is again, you just look at the how many days did it take from the last time that it was at a peak to come back to the average. And you would get kind of a sense for uh, how fast mean reversion is. So um, having done this, uh, let me get, give you an example and then we'll move into, um, into uh, maybe like questions if, there, if there's any question. So um, here I have a software um, that I built. It, this is still in a beta version. Uh, it's not fully finalized. But essentially what it does is when I kind of let me refresh it, it basically pulls the data for a variety of stocks. In this case, um, I have a number of underlines, as you can see here. And um, uh, for each of these, the first thing that it does, it, it calculates a, a correlation. So what I do here is, first of all, choose a, a reference date. So I am choosing today's day. And then looking back at 150 data days in the past. So 150 days, these are calendar days, which means actually 104 uh, trading days, okay? So what we're seeing in this chart on the left is the correlation between each pair of assets that is being calculated with uh, 104 data points for each, for, each, uh, for each asset. And so the value, when you see, um, basically you just look at one, either the lower triangular or the upper triangular, triangular. this matrix is, is a symmetric, meaning that uh, if you look at with respect to the diagonal, the values that are opposite, symmetrical with respect to the, to the diagonal are always the same. So here you see 71.3. And so you see the same value on the, on the lower side of the diagonal. So you can just look at one triangle, one side of the triangle under the matrix. And essentially, the more the values are blue, the more it means that there's a high correlation. So in this case, for example, the QQQ has a 96.4% correlation with SPY. And Google has an 81.5 correlation with, with pi and, and so on. On the right side, you're seeing the same calculation, but this time, instead of doing it across 104 days, I'm doing this around 30 days. So and you can choose here how much day, days of history you want on the left side and how much days of history you want on the right side. Now, why are we doing this correlation uh, with a kind of longer term versus a short term is because we're trying to find out if the correlation is stable across time, does it change a lot or can I rely on this relationship? Basically, if we find that two assets are highly correlated, 
in, in, in a short time frame, let's say 30 days, but then they're not highly correlated in the long term, chances are that I just found a very spurious correlation and I should be careful before deciding to trade this thing because yeah, I may have found something, but it, it, it's not necessarily the case that this relationship is true, right? So, so again, this is kind of first way to kind of uh, look at these values. Um, the second step here is actually, let me, let me just reset back to the original values. So let me kind of pull down here. So here is for every single uh, pair of assets, what we're doing is again, calculating the long-term correlation, the short-term correlation, then we're calculating, the, we're running the regression to find what is the pair ratio. And so this value, this is the beta, the beta value. And, um, and then we have uh, the intercept on the right side. So this is the, the, the average value of the spread. And then we're checking for stationarity. So when you see these stars, this is the p-value. So four stars is the maximum. It's a, it's a very good estimate. We can rely quite confidently. If you see like um, this, uh, this stop sign, it basically means that from a statistical perspective, um, we cannot conclude for sure that that estimate is good. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It means that we just cannot say for sure that it's a good estimate. Unfortunately, with statistics, when the when the p-value is not is not uh, when you, when you don't see stars, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that you cannot make a conclusion uh, for certain with with a certain, with a certain certainty. And so you have to take it with a bit of grain of salt. Um, Again, we're, we're evaluating the, the stationarity of the spread that we're calculating zeta index. So in this case, take a look at the first at the first one. We see that the, this DAL and AL, so this is a, a Delta airline and American Airlines. Again, this was calculated today on the data that was just finished today. This is daily data, daily returns. And uh, this spread has a 2.29 standard deviations away. It's a very, unlikely case. I mean, the spread is very far away. And what you see on the right, it tells you what to do. It means, well, you should short the uh, Delta airline and, and go long with uh, with Apple. Same story you could uh, in with, with, with Spy and, and QQQ. You should, for example, well, you should I mean uh, at your own risk, but this is what the software is suggesting. Um, you should short Spy and go long with Qs and so on. And so, on each of these pair is analyzed, and um, essentially we are we are rank scoring them from the best pair to the worst pair uh, by uh, kind of uh, doing a kind of a, a weighted average of all of these things together. We're looking at the short term correlation, long term correlation. Are all of these coefficients good coefficients or not? So by pulling all of these together, basically, if 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 all the things are good, obviously this pair gets a high score. If some of these things are not that good, the, the score tends to be uh, worse. So if I scroll down, you'll see, for example, one of the lowest one here, you can see that it's basically zero correlation, um, either long-term or short-term. None of the estimations are good or pretty much none of them are, are, are good. And so that's why we're saying, well, do not trade this thing. It's, it's, it's kind of rubbish, right? You don't want you don't, you don't to trade the third pair because you have no statistical advantage in doing that. So next thing is, okay, great, but uh, let me see how this works. So if I, for example, click on the first one, um, here on the on the bottom, I get a bunch of charts. So <clears throat> first of all, uh, let's start from the uh, bottom left. You see the, the price chart of, of the two assets. And as you can see, they are kind of moving pretty much together. On the right side, you're seeing um, the, the, the correlation and the, and the linear relationship between the two. So you see the... the, the uh, there are two lines, and the, the, basically the difference between the two is that for the gray points and the gray line, we're using the full amount of data, in this case, 105 days. And for the red line, we're using only the, the 30 days. So, and, and again, I can change here. Um, let's say if I move this one to 68, you'll see that more red points are going to be used, and we're using 68 points to calculate the regression. Again, what this is telling me is that in this particular case, both the short term and the long term basically have the same characteristics, which means that this is the pair that it's fairly stable over time. So it's a, it's a good pair to potentially trade. And now finally here, <clears throat> what we're seeing is uh, that the gray line is the spread and the spread is being calculated using um, those the, that pair ratio of 2.44 that you see here. And um, 
the red line is basically uh, um, when we when we test for stationarity, we also go and calculate the model. It's called the uh, ARMA model. Actually, it's an ARIMA model. In, well, no, sorry, it's an ARMA model, which is a outer aggressive moving average. Um, I won't get into the details, but basically it tries to forecast what this spread might look like in the future. And, and uh, what we're seeing here is that the gray line is telling us that right now we are above two standard deviation. You see here, you have two standard deviation, one standard deviation. These are all marked on the right side. And so it's telling me right now, the spread is about above two standard deviation. So there is a certain probability that this spread might come back in the next uh, 10 days. And then the forecast here is 10 days, but I can increase the forecast, let's say to 15 days or 20 days. And it's, it's gonna give me like a con of, of probability by which the spread should move in the next, in, the, in this case, 18 days of, of forecast. And so, um, so you can use this one to kind of get a feel for where the spread might move. Is it good that I, that I and also like you can look at the past and see what, was it true that when it went above, did it come back or not? So you can you can have this information. But another thing you can do is also um, back test this because I can change my reference date to a point in the past. Let's say I don't know, um, let's say August uh, or whatever. Just pick a date. Um, and what this is doing is is basically positioning back in time to that particular point point in time, and it's showing me that at that particular point in time the spread was about one standard deviation away, and as you can see, now we have real data because the gray the gray point is showing me what the actual spread did afterwards, and the and the red one was uh, the prediction. Now, obviously, the prediction is never going to be perfect, especially if you're trying to forecast 18 days. However, as you can see, the the, the actual spread moved within the 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 confidence the confidence interval, which is the the gray shaded area that you see the, this kind of cone, and so it gives you some good uh, feel for. What this might do in in and, and how it behaved in the past. So you can kind of backtest this in, in the past and see whether that 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 uh, estimate was, was good or not. And again, I can go back here and say, let's pick the the one that was at the top. Spy was two standard deviation away, and as you can see here, there was a minus two standard deviation, and then afterwards it came back in to the average. So again, if I traded this and 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 went along the spread, I would have made money, right? So this is the way you can use this software potentially to um, um, back test uh, as well as obviously forecast what could happen in, in the future. Um, so uh, last thing is, let's just go to today. So I'm just gonna refresh. I wanna give you a, a real example of how we could use this. And again, this is a tra trade idea, take it as it is. So please trade at your own risk. But I, I looked at the SPY and, and QQQ, right? For, and um, so let me go back here. We see that we are 2.8 standard division away. So, which means that there's a good chance that this is going to come back in terms of revert to the mean. So you can see here's where the spread is right now. And this is the cone of future that the, the software is predicting. Uh, in theory, the spread could come back. I mean, not there's no certainty. It could continue to, 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 to increase. But given that it's two standard deviation away, there's a certain probability that it's going to come back. And so how can we trade this? Well, the software is telling us that we should short the SPY and go along the, the queues. So what I did here is I just, and also the ratio, the, sorry, the, the pair ratio is, is basically uh, 1.05, essentially is, is one to one, one share of, of SPY for one share of Q. So what I did was um, I went into um, uh, Tinkerswim, if I can manage to bring it to the screen, I don't know why it's not showing. Uh, one sec. And um, now I, I don't I don't like to trade spy for a couple of reasons, it's, uh, but pr primarily is because there is not enough number of strikes within one standard deviation, which means that it, it doesn't give you a lot of room for for adjustments if you want to adjust your delta or if you want to adjust your your position to turn it into a free trade. And so um, I like to use SPX because it has more strikes in between the various the one standard deviation, and so. Since the, I know that SPX is 10 times the, the SPY, what I'll do is instead of using a, 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 a beta of one, meaning that one share of SPY to one share of Qs, I will do one share of SPY to 10 share of, sorry, one share of SPX to 10 shares of Qs. And this way the ratio is still gonna be um, the equivalent if I were to use SPY and, and Qs. So what I did here is 
um, I took I, I just I know that I need to go short with with the SPX, so I decided to to go short. I could have uh, shorted the, the index. Well, I could have actually shorted the future if I wanted to, or I could have um, uh, maybe bought a, a long put spread or or sold a call spread. In this case, I decided to use um, uh, basically a, a butterfly. It's a kind of a dragonfly, and uh, and this is going to be a debit. So it's going to cost me three hundred and seventy five dollars for 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 uh, for this butterfly. And um, essentially, if I look at the delta, is minus 1.16, right? So since I have 1.16, 1.16 deltas of SPX, I need to get uh, times 10 will mean about 116 deltas of Qs on the opposite direction because I want SPX to go down. And, and so if I go to, to the Qs, I did similar way again using a butterfly, and this time I put I I, I sold a, a kind of a, a broken wing butterfly with the puts, which is now uh, which if I, but I sold 10, 10 contracts because I needed ten contract to get to about one hundred and twenty deltas. So as you can see, to find the right delta, you could either move your strikes, you could move it left or right the whole thing, or you could increase the number of contracts so to get the right ratio of delta that you want. So let me show you what happens here. So let's assume, for example, that nothing happens. The stock doesn't move in either direction, right? So uh, it stays where it is. Well, if it stays where it is, uh, and, and by the way, these butterflies are, are expiring on the 4th of November. So we're talking about basically Friday of next week. So if nothing happens, this butterfly on the queues is going to make $1,000 in profit, right? Or if it goes up, again, it's going to make $1,000 in profit. Um, and on the on the uh, SPX side, remember if if nothing happens, I will lose three hundred and seventy five dollars. But again, if if nothing happens on both sides, uh, this loss will be highly compensated by the win on the SPX on the Q side. Uh, on the on the other hand, if the spread goes in the direction that I want, meaning that SPX is going to go down, obviously I'm going to make more money as well as QQQ is supposed to go up. So, and also there, I'm gonna make more money. Um, so obviously there's a, a final case where the spread could go completely against me, meaning that the Q is gonna crash and the SPX is gonna go up. So in that case, I could potentially lose on both sides and it could hurt me. But the reason why I use butterflies instead of pure spread is because um, you can still do, you have, you have a bit of maneuver, you can adjust a little bit. Uh, if things go 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 the wrong side, um, or for example, if it goes in the, in the right direction, you I, you can kind of uh, sell condors inside, or you can sell additional butterflies inside to turn to turn this whole structure and kind of uh, lift the whole the whole um, expiration line up and potentially transform it into a free trade. And so uh, there's a lot of adjustment you can do with butterflies, and that's why I, I kind of like trading this spread using butterflies rather than plain spreads. But again, you can do it with anything you want. Just basically look at the deltas and and put the right ratio. And uh, just remember that delta is not static, so you may have to uh, adjust it as the thing as the things move around. Because again, the the while with stock the delta is fixed, but with the with the with the options the delta is um, is moving. And um, with that, I'm I'm done. So I don't know if there's any question. Um, well, one question, uh, Rocco, would be that's a great presentation. Thank you. One, one pr uh, pr a question would be the software you're demonstrating there. Is that yours, or are you going to make it available? Is it available for sale? Uh, so right now it's still in beta. I'm, basically, it's pretty much finished. Uh, all it, uh, for example, here you can also choose different uh, symbol lists. Like, uh, for example, uh, so let me refresh here because I picked up something that. So, for example, I could choose technologies. Or transportation, so it's going to look at different sectors. You can even create your own your own lists and uh, or create copies and things of the nature. So the point about this is, I just had to finalize a few more things here and and then hook it up to live data to get the latest data on every every single day. Um, and then eventually this will be a service uh, like a subscription service. Uh, but we yeah. haven't launched it yet. Uh, I'm hoping to have this done in the next few months um, and then we'll, we'll launch it. Okay, so how would people get on the list for a notice of that? Uh, you can just send an email to um, info at optiontraders.it 
um, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll add you to a list, and uh, and then we'll let you know if anyone is interested. Because obviously, the, the software is in English, so everyone everyone can can use it. it doesn't matter. People could translate with Google Translate yeah. or whatever. So it's info at optiontraders.it. Optiontraders.it. Yes, and you'll find this in the in the in the slides here as well. Oh, okay. Okay, super. Well, yeah, you're going to make the slides available for people later. I mean, uh, okay, let's see. Does, who has uh, some que a question or two? So John is asking if, um, if the look-back period of 150 and 30 days are a good example of actual look-back periods that are used for trading. Uh, yes, I, I kind of use this one because um, you see 150 uh, days turns into basically what uh, almost six months of trading of trading days, give or take. So it gives you enough history to judge whether a pair is uh, fairly stable. And 30 days of trading is a month of data. So uh, the point is again, the more data you put into your history, the more accurate you get your, your correlation. The problem is that um, that relationship might break over time. Relation, again, correlation changes over time. You, you, um, uh, the, the relationship, the, the beta that the you estimate changes with time as well. So um, you, I mean, the, for me, it's kind of a compromise between uh, something which is, you need to have at least a good number of, of points. So that's why at least 30 points. So you can do some good estimation uh, and 30 is already kind of on the low end, uh, but you cannot put too many points. Otherwise um, you you lose kind of the, your model becomes too static and it doesn't move well with, 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 with the market. So you got to have kind of a trade off between the two. Um, to answer to Pader, it says if after a movement, if you have imbalance of delta, what do you do? Um, I would I would adjust the position like either uh, again try to not flatten the delta, but like uh, again try to bring it back to the ratio that that I had. So maybe I I I, I make in this case, for example, I may uh, make my battlefield a little bit smaller or bigger, depending on the case. Um, or you may add some something else as well. Again, uh, with options, you have much more. Uh, Ways of adjusting delta than 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 they do with, with, with stock, and so but the, the downside of this is that you, it requires more active uh, um, style of management. Um, Alexander is asking, can you find pairs with smaller caps? For example, Hecla, it is a it is a volatile silver stock to billion market cap. So you can. I mean, uh, right now uh, in this sample data, I only have a bunch of stocks here because I didn't pull the whole history, but the the, the plan to basically uh, connect it with, the, with NASDAQ and pull down the whole historical data of, or at least like 10 years worth of data for all of the US equity stocks, ideally. And uh, so it would be kind of big enough to potentially cover everything. But again, also keep in mind that um, uh, if you're looking at uh, non-liquid instruments, uh, you may still use this for, for, for example, just write out buying and selling the stock, but just be careful with options because uh, when the, those instruments are liquid, um, you, it, it could be very difficult to either enter or exit those trades, or uh, you will get very bad feels, or you may not be able to get out when you want to get out. So um, just be careful with, with instruments which are not very liquid. Uh, so Ron is asking the max risk for honestly exception trade was around four hundred dollars or so, but the max risk on the queues was about seven k. I assume the four would combine your strategy with some kind of max stop loss rather than just only yes, of course. Um, I would yeah, I would obviously I would kind of look at this as a whole. I mean, again, this is an example. Please do not trade like without doing your own math. Uh, I know I, I know you want, but uh, this is just an example of what you could do. But again, yeah, here the, the risk is very high, so. Uh, you would have to kind of look at this, and if it if it starts going the wrong direction, you would close either with a stop loss right very quickly or try to adjust. Uh, but uh, yes, I would I wouldn't leave this because it's this example is quite unbalanced. But I I have examples where the risk on both sides was like a few hundred bucks or or or, or a thousand bucks at most on each side, but it was kind of balanced. That would be the best way. Uh, I did this very kind of quick and dirty today to try to find a a, um, a trade. Kind of like ten minutes before the show, so for the presentation, so I didn't spend too much time on adjusting and finding a better trade. Uh, yes, you could do a lateral vertical. I, you're absolutely right. 
uh, on both sides. So you could do long one spread and, and short the other spread. Um, and that's probably the easiest way to do it. Um, the 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 reason I again I I wanted to show an example a little bit more complicated is because with with butterflies you have a little more, more little bit more flexibility but but you're totally right you could do this with with, with spread which is probably the easiest, simplest way to, to to start with um, looks like there are no no more questions. Uh, yeah, so the coin integration here is calculated when we do the, um, so let me go back here to the slides. Um, so, and, and I didn't mention it explicitly, but essentially when we are verifying for checking for stationarity, uh, this method of, uh, which is, um, which is the just augmented Dicky Fuller test essentially, uh, looks for stationarity, which implies that there is a, uh, that these, that these two, pairs of, of, of uh, this, this pair of two assets are co-integrated. So co-integration means that you find a linear, linear relationship between the two, which is exactly what we're doing when we're basically calculating, uh, what is it? Uh, sorry, let me find this again. So we're estimating this formula, right? Uh, co-integration basically means that we find a linear relationship, basically we find the beta and the alpha such that the, once we calculate the spread, which is the difference, so whatever is left, this spread is an, a, a, an integrated process of, of order zero, which is basically, it's a constant. So if we are finding the alpha and the beta, and we check for stationarity, and this is oscillating around the average, that basically means that the pair is co-integrated. I, I didn't go into the, the co-integrated, I didn't mention it before because it's a, a, a takes people for a spin as to what the co-integration means and, and the formal aspect of it. But essentially checking for stationarity uh, would imply that in this case, that the, the pair is co-integrated. 